So in this video we're going to cover reliability and validity as well as the intra-class correlation coefficient in estimating reliability. Now we often think of those two terms reliability and validity as consistency, repro reproducibility, and accuracy respectively. And, and those are, are, are true, but there are certain nuances in the definition, specifically if you're looking at validity. So I have here four scenarios of a, a bullseye, of you know an archer is just trying to hit the, the center of that bullseye, trying to hit it on target. And A, B, C, and D represent four different scenarios or four different sets of results. So between all these four scenarios, which do you think is the most consistent set of results? Correct, it would be C. This person was able to hit the same spot on the target consistently in all four trials. However, we believe that A is the most reliable and valid measure if we consider it to be the center of the bullseye to be the gold standard, which we do, right? So this person was able to consistently hit the target um, in the center of that bullseye in A. So that refers to reliability and validity. And when in terms of validity, there are three types of measurement validity that's often cited in kinesiological research. The first one's called content related validity and this refers to the degree to which a measurement or a test um, is able to measure what it's designed to measure. In other words, I wouldn't use a blood pressure cuff and spectrometer to measure someone's jump height. Would it make sense? It has, wouldn't have good content related validity. Construct validity is it's, it's somewhat abstract. The word construct really literally means a, a, a hypothesis, a theoretical construct. So construct validity is often used to describe the degree to which a test is able to measure the change in a variable that's unobservable, such as pain or function, right? So they say you use visual analog uh, scores, right? Visual, visual analog scale score, VAS scores to measure someone's pain level. And you do before and after, I don't know, uh, icing. We believe that if that visual analog scale is has good construct validity, it would capture, accurately capture the change in pain from, from pre to post. So that's called construct validity and that is measured typically in a research design or a rare hypothesis driven research study. Criterion validity is the, the the type of validity that most students think of when they hear the word validity because it terms it refer, reflects the accuracy of a particular field test. It's the degree to which these measurements match up to the measurements made with a gold standard to the criterion method. I often use aerobic capacity as an example, VO2 max. So one way to measure aerobic capacity in, you know, at least on the field is what's called ratings of perceived exertion or RPE. So if I measured everyone's RPE and I also concurrently have them measure their, their, their VO2 max, which is considered to be the gold standard, the correlation between those two would give us a level of or measurement of criterion validity. In this case, concurrent validity. Predictive validity is very similar, only that the criterion or the gold standard um, happens in the future, right? You're trying to predict someone's injury risk or predict someone's disease based on cholesterol. So for the most part in kinesiological research and if you're following these series of lectures for my research methods course or my undergrad measurement theory course, we're mainly going to concentrate on concurrent validity. Now, what are the desired qualities for a criterion measure for a gold standard in which we're trying to validate, if you will, these field tests that we use. Well, one, it has to be relevant. You know, we want, you know, what is the extent to which the criterion exemplifies success, right? So VO2 max for aerobic capacity, um, a bot, not bot, bot, uh, DEXA, or underwater weighing if we're looking at body composition, uh, force platforms if we're looking at ground reaction force or, or jump heights and things like that. How, how are those relevant to the, uh, the measurement that we're trying to make? It has to be free from bias. Everyone has to have the same opportunity to achieve a successful score. Right? And all of these criterion measurements are able to be bias free, has to be readily available either in the lab, you know, in some cases you might be able to do this in the field or in the training room, but most of all it has to be reliable. You can't predict the criterion if you can't measure it. And these next few slides we're going to talk about the reliability in some of the ways, more specifically using the ICC, the Interclass Correlation in Measuring Reliability.
So reliability is a measure of consistency or reproducibility of multiple measurements taken under the same conditions. Whenever we make a measurement, that observed score or that observation is made up of the true score of the, this, the true attribute of the patient or the performance of an athlete, as well as the error in which that measurement was made. And the source of the measurement error could be random noise or it could be systematic in nature in which the error tends to trend up or, or trend down due to the measurement tool itself or through other sources of variance in our subjects. The way we can express reliability um, is through correlation, either the, using the interclass correlation, such as the Pearson, or the intraclass correlation, which this video will focus on when we're taking multiple measurements. So the interclass, as I mentioned, is measured typically with the Pearson simple correlation. Um, its weakness is that it can it's limited to only two sets of data. So if I'm looking at two trials, for example, test retest, that is an example of interclass reliability using the Pearson correlation. You're just looking at the association of two trials. But more often than not, we're interested in the reliability of multiple trials, right? We have three or more trials. So we can't use the interclass correlation. We have to use an intra class correlation and that intra class correlation is based off an analysis of variance more specifically a repeated measures analysis of variance in fact the variance components of an ANOVA actually make up the components of an intra class correlation so just before we get into the ANOVA and before we actually perform an ICC or intra class correlation coefficient in our studio I just want to back up to the theoretical definition of reliability so I mentioned earlier reliability so it's is a measure of consistency in in multiple measures taken under the same conditions. From a variance perspective reliability is actually the ratio between true variance and the total variance is the proportion of the total variance that is true and then right here this is a very simple formula that shows that the between subjects variability that's the, there are true attributes the differences between subjects and the proportion of the total the total variance which is made of the of the between subjects variance as well as the error gives us reliability. So you can see if you have a reliability of one, it is consistent. It has high reliability. So I've shown this box. This box represents the total variance that's made up of what is true in error, and the percentage of that total variance gives us reliability. And the scale that we use for um, reliability in this case is from zero to one. Zero closer to zero means low reliability, whereas closer to one represents high or strong reliability. So some of the ways that we establish uh, reliability, you know, we do this for the test retest. You might have heard of the alpha coefficient. They're all based off what's called the interclass method. There are different types of methods, but the ones that we're going to concentrate on in this video is the interclass correlation coefficient. So the intraclass correlation coefficient, or ICC, is based on a repeated measures ANOVA. So if you're familiar with an ANOVA, you know that the three sources of variance is due to between subjects, that is true, as well as within subjects that do the trials, that gives us a systematic error, and error, that's the random noise, that's the unexplained variance. So all three components of variance can be used to calculate the various models of the ICC. Now, the different models that are based on both research design and form, whether you're taking a single trial or an average of multiple trials. It, um, the, the description of these, it's beyond the scope of this video. So I'm not going to go over details on the different of the, the differences between these six models. I'm going to concentrate on mainly on the ICC-3-1 using this sample data. So this is uh, 10 subjects that were tested on the Wingate anaerobic power test. They performed these three trials a week apart, and we want to know whether or not there is systematic differences or systematic error between all three trials. Uh, this is how it looks uh, in graphical form. You could see just by looking at the graph that there really isn't much difference in the Wingate power uh, test. And by the way, these are in watts. These are the average watts for trial one, trial two, and trial three. You can tell that there's not much difference. However, this only tells us how the differences between each trial. For 
for this sample. It doesn't tell us what the general population is doing, so we have to run a repeated measures ANOVA in order to determine whether or not there is actually a systematic difference between all three trials. So we're going to do this in our studio and then come back and analyze the data. Alright, so I've got here uh, some code that I've already written to run the interclass correlation coefficient. So as I mentioned earlier, we have to run a repeated measures analysis variance to determine whether or not there are systematic differences between all three trials of the Wingate power test. I'm going to load the libraries that I need. I'm going to load that uh, Wingate power data set that I just showed you. Convert that to long. Initiate the variables in the columns of data. Go ahead and summarize that and plot it. I already show you how it looks in graphical form. You can tell just from the plots that there's not much difference between all three trials, but we have to run an ANOVA to actually determine that. So run the repeated measures ANOVA. The dependent variable here is watts, obviously, that's power. Um, and the independent variable is time, trial one, two, and three, as well as the source of variance due to within subjects um, the uh, systematic error and the random error. Alright, so let's go ahead and take a look at the results of this analysis of variant. Okay, so let's take a look at the summary table of the repeated measures ANOVA. If you're familiar with ANOVA, then the elements in the summary table should be familiar to you. This first part represents the source of variance due to between subjects, right? That is, quote-unquote, the true variance. And down here, this is the variance due to time, trial 1, trial 2, and trial 3. Hence, you'll see degrees of freedom uh, is 2. And this represents the error, degrees of freedom 18. So the ratio of that true variance to the error variance is 0.261, and the probability of observing that F value is 77.3%. So in other words, we can conclude that there is no statistical significant difference in anaerobic power between trials 1, 2, and 3, or in the context of repeatability, we can conclude that there is no systematic error or very or a systematic error between trials that is negligible, that we can ignore, or that there is uh, no systematic difference in anaerobic power between trials 1, 2, and 3. So now we can conduct the interclass correlation coefficient. And before we go into our studio, uh, to analyze the ICC, it helps to at least describe the different forms. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into every single detail with the type or form of the interclass correlation coefficient. It gets pretty complicated, but it all depends on the the intent and the design in which the ICC is being used. In this case, we're running the same test, the Wingate test, multiple times on every single subject, right? And, and measuring the anaerobic power of every single subject. So that would entail a 3-1 form of the interclass. So 3 is the model, 1 is the form of the interclass correlation. 3 means that we're using the exact same test, the Wingate test, one meaning that we're only going to use one single trial from each iteration of the of the Wingate. The reason why I use one is because if you were to run the Wingate test in the future, typically we would only use a single trial to represent the or measure the anaerobic power of that athlete, as opposed to collecting multiple tests and taking the average of those tests. So this is the ICC 3-1. We're going to go into our studio and run the interclass correlation coefficient and then come back and take a look at the results. Alright, so now I'm in our studio. I'm going to be running an interclass or calculate an interclass correlation coefficient in our studio using what's called the ICC. Right? Oddly enough, it's called ICC. Uh, this function is a part of the psych, yeah, that's literally the name of it, uh, psych package and loaded the library which is loaded here. So I can run and assign the results of the ICC to this data vector called icc.watt and go ahead and print it out. These are the results. Let's take a look. So again, we are using ICC31. Model is 3 and we're using a single trial 
or the, we will be using the Wingate test for or a single trial of the Wingate test in the future as opposed to taking the average of multiple trials. So that is an ICC 3 comma 1. In this case is 0 0.72, 0 0.72, which is on a scale from 0 to 1 is considered to be moderately strong. So we conclude that the reliability of the Wingate power test for multiple trials with weeks apart, one week apart, is moderately strong. The ICC, or the Interclass Correlation Coefficient, is a relative index of reliability. It's unitless, right, from 0 to 1, and it's sensitive to between subjects' variability. In fact, it's a ratio of between subjects' variability and the total variability or total variance in a group or sample of individuals. So it is reflective of the ability of a test to differentiate between different individuals in a test result. However, if you're a practitioner, if you're a clinician, athletic trainer, a physical therapist, or a coach that wants to make inferences about these test results on these individuals, the ICC is not very useful. So we need to use another index of reliability, and one of them is known as the standard error of measurement, and it provides an absolute index of reliability. In fact, this is one of the formulas that's used to estimate or calculate the SEM is equal to the product of the standard deviation and the square root of 1 minus the reliability that's measured using the interclass correlation coefficient. And if you notice here, this is standard deviation. This is the standard deviation of all the trials that were collected using a particular test. And it's in the units of the test itself. So Wingate test was the was watts. If I'm measuring range of motion, that's in degrees. If I'm measuring jump heights, that's in you know centimeters or inches. So from a practical perspective, the SEM is a lot more useful than the ICC. In fact, if we assume that the scores are normally distributed, we can calculate the 95% confidence interval, which provides the boundaries of an individual's true score. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, this was a study that was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine a few years ago out of the University of North Carolina, and they looked at two tests to measure posterior shoulder tightness, or PST. Uh, this is commonly seen in overhead athletes in which the rotator cuff muscles or the, the posterior capsule will tend to tighten up, and so they're limited in range of motion, particularly in the internal rotation, glenohumeral internal rotation. So there are two ways to test that. One is in the side-lying uh, version here, in which the individual li is lying sideways, and the shoulder is l literally dropped, and the distance in which the drop is provided gives us the measurement for post -shoulder, posterior shoulder tightness. Another way to measure posterior sh or PST, posterior shoulder tightness, is using the supine version, using a goniometer, where the individual uh, lie supine and the trainer or PT then passively horizontally adducts the shoulder in this direction and the range of motion is then measured right in degrees so they had the test I believe they ran it five times for each of the tests and they measured the reliability for both the side lying and the supine version of the PSC and these are listed here as 0.83 and 0.91 uh, respectively for the sideline supine version of the PSD, and then those are actually pretty good numbers, right? 0 0.83 and 0.91 are mildly strong, but the supine version, at least according to these numbers, is more or, or stronger, I should say, in terms of reliability. Now let's take a look at the SEM. As a trainer, as an athletic trainer, I want to know which one is more precise the sideline version of the PSD or the supine version of the PST. Yeah, the uh, supine version, right? 1.1 degree, that's pretty precise in that whatever I measure in terms of, in this case, horizontal adduction um, of the PSC in a supine version is more reflective of the person's true score, of the person's true um, supine PSC degrees in this case. So that's how you would use the ICC and the SEM in a clinical example.